The Führerbunker, built beneath the gardens of the Reich Chancellery in central Berlin, is now a symbol of Nazi desperation and decline during the final days of World War II. Despite its impressive engineering, designed to withstand intense attacks, its interior told a different story. Among its thick concrete walls and labyrinthine corridors, the air was heavy and imbued with a nauseating odor, mixed with the smoke of diesel generators and human sweat. Amid an atmosphere of paranoia, marked by ominous silence and whispered conversations, the Führer and his close associates faced their final days. Down here, Hitler made the decision to order the total destruction of Berlin while simultaneously marrying Eva Braun. Join us in this new installment of military history as we delve into Adolf Hitler's final resting place, the Führer Bunker. Prepare to descend into darkness. The construction of the bunker began in 1943 as a desperate response to the relentless bombing campaigns unleashed by the Allied forces. The excavation was a race against time. Excavators worked three shifts daily in the Chancellery Courtyard to bring the subterranean monster to life. Over 30 rooms, equipment, a sophisticated ventilation system, and perfect camouflage to avoid detection ensured its impregnable nature through massive concrete walls, some reinforced with layers of armored metals. Designed to withstand the fiercest assaults, its thick walls and labyrinthine corridors provided refuge for Hitler and his inner circle as the war drew to a close. The bunker's layout spoke for itself regarding its function. An upper level housed administrative offices and conference rooms, while the lower levels contained the Nazi leader's personal quarters, a dining area, and medical facilities. Discreetly hidden emergency exits offered escape routes through tunnels leading to nearby buildings, a last resort in the face of imminent danger. Below this grand bunker, about 15 meters deep, the Reich's architect, the aristocratic Albert Speer, planned and built the Führer bunker with his team, intended for the security of Hitler and his trusted military chiefs. The facility was of remarkable German solidity. It featured a perimeter wall two to three meters thick and a concrete roof four meters thick. It is believed to have also included a steel layer inside. As this historian explains, its two-level structure was designed to withstand the most powerful bombings. El búnker tenía dos niveles. El primero fue construido en 1936, debajo de una parte de la Cancillería del Reich. Y el segundo, a partir de 1943, cuando se hizo evidente que el primer búnker que tenía el techo a unos 60 metros de altura no resistiría las potentes bombas estadounidenses y británicas. The Führer bunker had around 18 rooms arranged on either side of a central corridor. The furnishings were quite austere, as space was limited and anything superfluous was eliminated. Hitler moved there in mid-January 1945, when Soviet troops were encircling the German capital. He had previously resided in the Chancellery and on the upper floor of the bunker, but the constant air raids had become too dangerous. Historian Joachim Fest, in his best-known work, The Downfall, described the atmosphere as follows. When in the days of the impending end, water was sometimes lacking, an almost unbearable stench emanated, mostly from the anteroom, where the fumes from the diesel generators, the penetrating smell of urine and human sweat created a repugnant mixture. The most detailed description of the Führer bunker was provided by the Soviets in a dossier presented to Stalin at the end of World War II. According to this historian, the Russian army was astonished by the discovery. Suddenly, with this descent into the very gut of what the Soviets called the Cave of the Beast, it's as if they discovered a treasure. Descending to the first level of the bunker, one would enter a room dominated by an armored door, behind which lay a complex divided into two halves. Before proceeding, the visitor would encounter several cabinets on the right wall, 
containing all the equipment for air protection, from gas masks to steel helmets, masks, and fire extinguishers. On the left, there was a rectangular table, various chairs, a wall clock, and a telephone booth. The first room on the right side served as the machine room, which also housed the ventilation system. Through another door, one could access several interconnected rooms that housed the telephone exchange. These included a first aid room where Hitler's on-duty doctor rested, two additional bedrooms and a small sleeping area. According to a version published by ABC in the 1980s, two of these rooms were reserved for propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels. However, the Soviet report indicated that they belonged to Theodor Morel, Hitler's personal doctor, and Heinz Linge, the German leader's aide. On the left wall, a door led to a service room, although space was also reserved for Blondie, Adolf Hitler's German shepherd dog, and her puppies. At the end of the corridor, an armored door, always guarded by a personal guard, led to the anteroom of the meeting hall. There, attendees would wait for the Fuhrer's arrival. Large and valuable paintings, mostly of Italian landscapes, adorned the walls, while between 12 and 16 chairs were aligned along the room. From this room, one could access the conference room, as well as Adolf Hitler's personal office and Eva Braun's quarters, the Nazi photographer who married the Fuhrer on the same day he committed suicide. A garbage room completed the corridor. The last three rooms were only accessible from the office and led to the most important rooms in the complex, the Fuhrer's bedroom, his bathroom, and his private lounge. The Fuhrer bunker had two emergency exits, According to the Soviet report, the first exit featured a spiral staircase covered with slabs. Above it, a cubic tower with thick concrete walls had been constructed. From the second exit, one could ascend to the surface via a metal fire escape, protected by a cylindrical tower equipped with several machine guns and observation posts. On January 16, 1945, Hitler descended into his final bunker and never emerged again. The failed battle of the Bulge in Belgium had been lost. There, the Nazis had expended their last real forces and abandoned their hopes. The last weeks of the war were utterly dramatic, as this historian recounts. By January of 1945, the situation for the Third Reich is absolutely critical, if not borderline catastrophic. I mean, the whole atmosphere at that time was one of everyone knew the end was coming, that was collapsing, but no one could, could really admit to it. With the Soviets closing in on Berlin, the Chancellery, once a magnificent and imposing building, had several of its wings in ruins. Broken windows, demolished walls, and hardly any intact glass remained. They were replaced by cardboard and poorly nailed planks. Only the enormous office remained. There, resplendent, the model of the dreamed Berlin, the capital of the thousand-year empire that Hitler had promised himself, was preserved. The leader always showed fear of assassination attempts and potential air raids. The two levels of the bunker were interconnected, and over the weeks, they became filled with employees and officials. The Third Reich, which once aspired to conquer the world, had been reduced to 30 underground cubicles where typewriters clattered and people had to move sideways to avoid bumping into each other in the hallways. The Fuhrer's move to the bunker did not mean the cessation of his activities. On the contrary, this place became his residence and main headquarters. However, meetings with his ministers and high-ranking military officials continued to take place at the Chancellery, thus maintaining an important connection with the political and administrative heart of the regime. In the official building, he gave speeches and awarded honors in an attempt to sustain the already shattered morale of his men. In a way, the underground hideout functioned for Hitler as a form of escape like a child refusing to listen to reality while adults explained that things were not as he imagined. Down below, reports arrived in a muted fashion. There was a temporal lag, especially with the harsh truth of the facts. The isolation heightened the sense of unreality, and at times, an unconscious optimism took hold of the main rooms. The lack of information about the outside world was interpreted as a good omen. 
If someone reported that some troops had repelled a Soviet attack, or that a defense had stalled the enemy's advance for a few days, an exaggerated enthusiasm emerged that could not hide the persistent fatalistic resignation. Because during those final months, the only news was bad. The disaster was so great that almost as an instinct, the Nazis in the bunker believed that nothing could get worse. They were wrong. This picture grew even darker considering that within the same bunker operated an information office. The employees, isolated several meters underground, reported to their leader on the external situation in Germany, what was happening in enemy territories, or what was being said about them. Naturally, the information they gathered, barely catching fragments of some radio broadcasts, was unreliable. Everything that used to happen in the imposing chancellery now took place in these fortified catacombs. The tiny rooms always contained more people than they could accommodate. Not only did Hitler have his own room there, but also Hans Krebs, chief of the general staff, other military leaders and their aides, secretaries, security guards, doctors, administrative staff, telegraphers and maintenance workers. It was like a small, frenetic village underground. The bunker was far from pleasant. Although it was an architectural feat, everything was uncomfortable, small and rudimentary. It couldn't compare to the luxury that had once surrounded the Nazi leaders. Hitler's excursions to the outside were rare. He led a somber ceremony to award medals to child soldiers in the gardens of the Chancellery. He then took a walk with his dog, Blondie. Upon stepping into the garden after months of confinement, he hoped that the fresh air would revitalize him. However, he was met with something akin to a blow to the stomach. The air was heavy, and the particles of dust from the millions of tons of rubble floated around. The acrid stench of death and gunpowder had become almost unbearable. The crackling of the fire devouring buildings and the increasingly close explosions showed that for the Germans, hell was still far from over. That short walk, perhaps, was what finally convinced Hitler that he had lost the war. Accustomed to dominating vast territories, he had been confined to his bunker for months. During his final 10 days of life, paranoia and despair turned him into an incoherent and unstable mess. During this time, he celebrated his birthday, got married, passed death sentences, distrusted everyone around him and further sharpened his manic character. But above all, for the first time, he realized that he had lost the war and that there was no escape. On April 22nd, after expelling several close collaborators on charges of treason and incompetence, Hitler asked his personal physician what was the most effective way to commit suicide. His doctor recommended the double method that he would carry out days later. Before his death, the leader was determined to drive Germany into total ruin as a final act of defiance in the face of impending defeat. His wish was that the victor should not be able to enjoy any of what had once been their empire and he also wanted to punish those citizens he deemed unworthy by holding them responsible for the defeat of the Third Reich. The Führer had proclaimed, if we go down, we will go down with us. However, his scorched earth orders were ignored by many of his subordinates. As Soviet troops advanced towards the bunker, officials and staff close to Hitler fled for their own lives. A few remained in the underground lair. Among them was the Goebbels family, Many years later, Traudel Junge, Hitler's secretary, recounted, In those last days, we were no longer capable of feeling normal emotions. We only thought about death. We wondered when Hitler and Eva would die, when the six children who lived with us would die, and of course, when and how we would die. On April 30th, 1945, just two hours before his suicide, the Führer called Traudel Junge to inform her that he was going to dictate his will. In the meeting room, only he and she were present. The woman expected Hitler to finally explain or justify his actions, but was disappointed to hear him grotesquely appoint the ministers who would succeed his government. Despite the despair and suffering surrounding the situation, 
The Nazi leader showed no compassion or pain in his words, leaving Junga with a feeling of emptiness and desolation. The tragic event occurred at half past three in the afternoon, when Hitler and Eva Braun decided to end their lives. They both took potassium cyanide pills as a means to carry out their purpose. However, while Braun ingested the capsule, the Führer decided to supplement the poison with a shot from a 7.65 mm Walter pistol to effectively ensure her death. This additional detail of the shot was due in part to concerns about the possible adulteration of cyanide. The effectiveness of the poison had already been proven earlier with the death of Hitler's loyal dog, Blondie. After hearing the shot, Heinz Linga was the first to verify that Hitler and Eva were dead. Dr. Ludwig Stumpfeger arrived seconds later to confirm their deaths. The two covered the bloody corpse with a blanket. Another group took care of Eva's body. The somber funeral procession was completed by Goebbels. Once outside, they were placed in a pit and doused with cans of petrol. Later, Erich Kempke, Hitler's personal driver, set fire to a rag soaked in fuel and threw it on the improvised funeral pyre. As the bodies burned, everyone present stood motionless with their arms raised, frozen in a kind of reverence before the flames that rose more than two meters high. Later, the Hamburg radio station solemnly broadcast Wagner's opera, Twilight of the Gods, After the war, the Soviets destroyed part of the lair, but its sturdy and solid structure remained largely intact. Between 1945 and 1949, the Russians carried out an intensive demolition campaign in Berlin, aimed at erasing any visible vestiges of the Nazi regime. This included the demolition of the ruins of the Chancellery and associated bunkers. Despite efforts to remove these symbols of the Third Reich, the underground lairs resisted destruction although some areas suffered partial flooding due to bombing and the passage of time. The area where the bunker complex was located was left neglected for many years. However, with German reunification, efforts were made to revitalize the site. During the construction of new residential and commercial buildings in the area, underground sections were discovered. Despite some attempts to preserve these historic structures, many were destroyed or ignored in the interest of urban development. The emergency exit point from the Führer bunker, which was previously located in the Chancellery Gardens, was replaced by a parking lot. On 8th July 2006, the Berlin Unterwelten Association, in cooperation with the General Administration of the Berlin Senate, installed an information board on today's Gertrude Kolmarstrasse, which tells the story of the Führer bunker. According to the latest tourism statistics, half of all visitors to Berlin express an interest in seeing the place where Hitler took refuge. For those who know its location, the typical tour includes first a visit to the Holocaust Memorial, followed by this seemingly ordinary park. Beneath the surface of the complex in every visitor's imagination lies the weathered, indestructible skeleton of the bunker that housed the man who unleashed devastation on Europe 80 years ago. That's it for the report. We invite you to share this video so that more people can discover, firsthand, the intriguing past of the Führer bunker and the grim circumstances surrounding Adolf Hitler's final days during World War II. Thank you for your interest and for joining us in this installment of Military History.